excited about this um, webinar, which will be full of information from a, some wonderful, wonderful that we have presented to you today. We are so happy that you are able to join us. I would like now to introduce our um, speakers, but to remind everyone to um, place your questions in the chat box. So at the end of the presentations, we will be able to um, respond to some of the questions that you are presented. I understand they're just close to 200 participants, so we're really excited. Our first presenter is Dr. Carol Neal, who is a native, native of Darien, Georgia. She moved to Jacksonville in 1984. She received her Associate of Arts degree from Florida Junior College, bachelor's degree in nursing from Bethune-Cookman University, master's degree from the University of Phoenix, and a PhD from Barry University in Miami. She loves serving in the community and making a positive impact. She owned and operated the Hope Adult Day Care Center for Seniors for over five years, managing a total of 29 Alzheimer's patients with a staff of 10 during weekdays. She is currently the president of the First Coast Black Nurses Association. Under her leadership, the organization hosted the first Health Disparity Summit in 2019. She has served in various leadership roles as co-lead for the Diversity Council for the Florida Action Coalition, the founder of Friends of Adult Day Service for over 10 years, and former CEO of Hope Adult Day Services. She is the recipient of numerous accolades, including being a project director mm -hmm. for a HRSA grant from 2015 to 2017. She received the President's Award for the Florida State College at Jacksonville and Great 100 Nurses Award all in 2013. She is currently a professor of nursing in the RN to BSN program at Florida State College in Jacksonville. Our second speaker is Dr. Pamela Harris Bryant. She is assistant professor and board certified pediatric nurse practitioner at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Nursing. As a 10-year faculty member, she currently is the specialty track coordinator for the UAB SON Pediatric Primary Care Nurse Practitioner Program, and she practices at UAB's newborn nursery. Dr. Bryant serves mm -hmm. in various leadership roles and is a member of several professional organizations, including the National League for Nursing, National Black Nurses Association, and the Association of Faculties of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners, where she is the chair for the Communications Committee. She is also a member of MBNA's Population Ad Hoc Committee and leads MBNA's Pediatric Population Focus Group. She received the Lamplighters Award in 2020 from the uh, Alabama League of Nursing for her leadership. Our final speaker is Angela Apia, who has over 23 years in healthcare, 20 years of it in nursing, 11 years of her experience is in healthcare leadership. Her accumulation experience in oncology includes surgery, medical, radiology, infusion therapy, and cancer program administrator. She is currently an assistant vice president of oncology services at Hackensack Meridian Health Mountainside Medical Center and an adjunct fac faculty for the College of Health Professionals School of Science and Leohard School of Nursing Programs at Pace University. She is currently a doctoral candidate pursuing a PhD in Doctor mm -hmm. of Nursing practice. She obtained her MSN from Vanderbilt University in Health Systems Management, MPH in Health Policy and Management, and Graduate Certificate in Managed Care from the New York Medical College, MA in Counseling, BA in Nursing, minor in Psychology from Eastern Mennonite University, a graduate certificate in Population Health Management at John Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Health.
She's an experienced healthcare executive leader with strong research, clinical, and operational background. She most recently mm -hmm. served as a senior administrative director of the Northwell Health Center Institute at Phelps Hospital, Northwell Health. She also served on multiple oncology leadership roles at the New York Presbyterian University Hospital of Columbia and Cornell and at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Our first speaker is Dr. Neal. Welcome, greetings everyone. I am the chair of the Ad Hoc Population Health Committee and we would like to say we want you to sit back and just enjoy um, what is happening in population health. But before we will um, get started, I would like to introduce our moderator. This is Dr. Frances Ash Goins. Dr. Goins is a public health expert, health administrator, policy analyst, and health educator. She's a registered nurse and received mm -hmm. her master's in public health and health education from the University of South Carolina in 1980. Currently, she is an expert consultant in public health and nursing and an adjunct professor at the University of South Carolina of Nursing and Arnold School of Public Health. She recently was a consultant for the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control on the development of the South Carolina Strategic Plan for Sickle Cell Management and the Florida Department of Health for the development of Florida Strategic Plan on Human Trafficking. Prior to her retirement from the federal government, she was the Deputy Director and Department of Health and Human Services Acting Director for the United States Department of Health and Human Services Office on Women's Health, where she was responsible for the development of initiation and implementation mm -hmm. for plans dealing with women programs and policies in partnership with other federal agencies, national and local health organizations, and leaders committed to the advancement of women's health. She also served on the White House Office on National AIDS Policy and National Commission on AIDS. She has received numerous awards, including several secretaries and Department of Health and Human Services Assistant Secretary for Health Awards for Distinguished Service. She is a national and international recognized speaker on health issues. She is a University of South Carolina Outstanding Black Alumni recipient. She was inducted into the American Academy of Nursing as a fellow and the recipient of an honorary Doctor of Philosophy degree mm -hmm. in 2016. She serves on several national and local boards, including the Board of Commissioners for the American Kidney Fund, Board of Directors for Women's Rights and Empowerment Network, the South Carolina Council of HIV AIDS Board of Directors, National Board for PAID, and is a national consultant for the National Training and Technical Assistance Center on Human Trafficking. Thank you, speakers. So without further ado, let's talk about population health. Um, this particular ad hoc um, group, we are focusing on, we have a focus group on sickle cell, we have a focus group on kidney disease, and we have a third focus group on pediatrics because we're looking at social isolation and different things as it relates to pediatrics. We are planning to have webinars the fourth, third, the fourth Tuesday mm -hmm. of every month until December on issues related to different population. And right now, I would like to turn everything over to start our webinar with Dr. Pamela Bryant. Good afternoon, everybody. And first of all, I would like to say thank you for attending our webinar. And my presentation will basically be, what is population health? Next slide, please. Objectives that will be covered during my presentation are define population health and its distinguishing components, describe the unique implications in providing health care with the population health focus, 
and highlight the advantages in providing population health care for the minority community. Next slide, please. So what is population health? According to the CDC, it is an interdisciplinary approach that allows health departments to connect practice to policy for change and a health outcome of a group of individuals. This approach utilizes non-traditional partnerships among different sectors of the community, public health, industry, academia, healthcare, local government entities, all with the goal to achieve positive health outcomes. Now, Kendi and Stoddard in 2003 broadly described population health as the health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of such outcomes within the group, and aims to improve the health of an entire human population and works across disciplines. Next slide, please. Geographic populations defined as a group. Now this group is not exhaustive, but a representation of population study. That would be nations, employees, ethnic groups, disabled persons, and prisoners. Why? The health outcome of such groups are of relevance to policymakers in both the public and private sectors. Note that population health is just not the overall health of a population, but also includes the distribution of health. Overall health could be quite high if the majority of the population is relatively healthy, even though a minority of the population is much less healthy. Ideally, such differences would be eliminated or at least substantially reduced. Next slide, please. We define populations at risk broadly, including but not limited to the poor, frail, disabled, economically disadvantaged, homeless, racial and ethnic minorities, persons with low literacy, victims of abuse or persecution, and persons with social risk factors such as isolation. The health domains of vulnerable populations can be divided into three categories, physical, psychological, and social. Those with physical needs include high-risk mothers and infants, the chronically ill and disabled, and persons living with HIV-acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Next slide, please. Approaches to population health would be to improve the health of the entire population, reduce health inequities among population groups. In order to reach these objectives, it looks at and acts upon a broad range of factors and conditions that have a strong influence on our health. Next slide, please. Social determinants of health are conditions in the environment which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risk. When we look at social determinants of health, we look at access to social and economic opportunities, the resources and supports available in our homes, neighborhoods, and communities, the quality of our schooling, the safety of our workplaces, the cleanliness of our water, food, and air, the nature of our social interactions and relationships. Health starts in our homes, schools, workplaces, neighborhoods, and communities. We know that taking care of ourselves by eating well and staying active, not smoking, getting the recommended immunization and screening tests, and seeing a doctor when we are sick all influence our health. The conditions in which we live explain in part why some Americans are healthier than others and why Americans are more generally not as healthy as they could be. Next slide, please. Health promotion of populations would be disease prevention, enhancement of quality of life, perpetuation of life, to promote ecological health, which is individuals and families and communities with systems of care, epidemiology research, where we monitor and diagnose the health concerns of communities and promote healthy practices, habits, and behaviors. Next slide, please. Collaboration is what it's going to take 
across all sectors. So interprofessional or collaborative care occurs when multiple health workers from different professional backgrounds provide comprehensive health service by working with patients, their families, caregivers, and communities to deliver the highest quality of care across settings. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we must work together collaboratively across sectors to address the needs of the community. Some collaboration on projects to address will be economic status. When we look at economic status, you need to think about poverty, employment, food insecurity, housing instability, instability. Do they move around frequently? Is it overcrowding where they're living? When we look at education, are they a high school graduate? Are they enrolled in higher education? What about language and literacy? We know that education is linked to disparities in employment because it, is, it affects the type of work people do, the working conditions they experience, and the income that they earn. When you look at health and health care, do they have access to health care? We know that poor health outcomes and disparities are linked to no care. What about access to primary care? Primary care is associated with positive health outcomes and it, and it offers a source of care. Um, you can have early detection and treatment of the, of the disease if they are treated earlier. What about health literacy? Do they know about their health? Are they able to understand what you're talking to them about. What about neighborhood and built environment? Do they have access to food that supports health, healthy eating patterns? What about the quality of their housing? What is the housing like? The physical condition of it? Was it a home built before the 70s where there's lead possibly in the paint that could affect their health? What about crime and violence and their environmental conditions? You have to think about the polluted air, poor or um, poor water, or extreme heat in cases like this. And when you look at social and community context, what about their social cohesion? Civic participation, do they vote? Are they doing any kind of volunteering work? We know that when people are out volunteering and networking with other people, they are usually happy and they are talking with someone and they are able to vent to them what's going on around them. Is there a lot of discrimination around their um, community? What about incarceration in their community as well? Next slide, please. When you look at population health example, uh, examples, primary, you want to prevent the violence from occurring and it may involve aiming to change attitudes. Secondary, you want to prevent recurrence of violence, maybe a screening program addressing um, risk factors such as alcohol use. And tertiary, you want to prevent death and disability. You want to treat the problems as a result of violence. So when we're looking at population health, we need to make sure that we look at primary, secondary, and tertiary issues. Next slide, please. Those are my references. Thank you, and now we will have Dr. Apia. Good afternoon, everyone. So, just like to share um, the implication of population health, and I'd like to take a scenario and walk us through uh, the presentation with it. So in this scenario, we will take a patient who is diabetic and a patient who is um, has a cancer diagnosis. Um, both have a uh, diagnosis of uh, pre-existing conditions that can impact their care. So when we think about population health implication, we have to take a look at the unique implication it has in our healthcare setting. So in our current healthcare setting, we have primary, you know, in, inpatient and outpatient ambulatory care. And with that comes the care process. So as we describe it as a continuation of care or transition of care that 
we have to consider when we're thinking about population health. So whether you work in an inpatient setting, ambulatory setting, home care, or you know a physical therapist, no matter what our um, profession is in the healthcare field, we do impact population health. Next slide, please. Next slide. So implication of um, population health impacts the outcomes. Um, so for example, if you have a patient who is newly diagnosed uh, or with diabetes or, or cancer, and in their community, they do not have a pharmacy or area where they can buy the glucometer or be able to have resources available to them to be able to take care of their new diagnosis, it will be hard for them to maintain the discharge instructions provided, provided for them uh, upon discharge from the inpatient setting. And if there is no continuation of care for that patient when they go home, the ambulatory care area also will see that impact as well, such as increased ED uh, admissions, uh, because that patient is routinely coming back due to the lack of resources. Uh, majority of the time, we do not associate um, these what we call social determinants with uh, a patient's diagnosis. And this is something that is being really taught in nursing schools and other health sciences currently, to be able to have a whole picture of a patient instead of just being specifically having a nursing perspective or having a physical therapy perspective or a doctor's uh, perspective. It's much easier to have a collaborative impact if everybody works together from, you know, a nurse, a navigator, uh, a nurse, a doctor, a social worker, a care coordinator to be able to impact uh, patients' uh, uh, care. And that's what we call population health. So majority of us know public health where we, you know, we look at the science of uh, preventing diseases and prolonging life uh, through uh, health initiatives such as promotion, he promoting health, um, as well as making choices that are life, life beneficial. That goes with the outcome of the group. So we are looking at the health promotion, the prevention, and impacting that with the health determinants such as where the person lives, what they have available in that community, and what, what pre-existing conditions they might have that might set them up for failure or progress in their treatment process. That is what population health implies and that's what us as healthcare professions have to keep in mind when caring for our patients uh, in that perspective. Next slide, please. So what does it mean for us as healthcare professionals when it comes to population health? Most of us are already doing this. Well, we don't call it population health. However, being able to impact that social determinants of health is that concept that we have to keep in mind. So a patient is admitted from the ED, goes up to the unit. The unit does the due diligence to care for the patient. Upon uh, patient discharge, the patient is going home, newly diagnosed, and we need certain things. It would take the social worker to be able to know that this patient lives in this community and might have maybe a food desert or might not have the resources they need. So instead of just saying, here is your resources, they will be able to say, I noticed that you have to travel five miles from your house to be able to get to the grocery store. And to be able to do that, we will have the nutritionist come see you to give you ideas of how you can do this or have the social worker come in to see what we can do or send the patient home with a, a, a home health aid, maybe the first week to make sure that patient is able um, to do that by working with, uh, let's say a visiting nurse uh, to be able to implement that. So those are the things we want to take a look at and be able to have a population lens when we're working with our patients, whether we're inpatient or ambulatory or even in our communities. Um, it takes a levels of care and everybody to be able to make sure that that patient care is um, taken care of and that includes the collaborative impact that that will have. So if you take, for instance, a patient who might need a glucometer and, you know, even though they might have insurance to care for it, their uh, CVS might not carry it. 
So now they have to look for ways to get it. And how do they do that? And when we're discharging that patient or when they're in the office being assessed, asking those questions helps with that population health impact. Next slide, please. So within the primary setting, it's more related to our public health um, components of population health, which is the prevention of a disease, prolonging life, and uh, having a health promotion impact. Um, that means that we have to work with numerous organizations. So if you take, for an instance, you have a, uh, a, teenage, a teenager who's diagnosed with diabetes, it would be good to see if the Boys and Gr Girls Club might have a mentor who might know something about um, diabetes to be able to check in with that, that person. That is the community resources we're looking at. Or is there a synagogue? Is there a church? Is there a place that um, the, the patient goes to that would be able to have that resource available to them if the patient doesn't have it? And what kind of support does the patient have? So we're taking that contextual changes that the patient might encounter when they get home and looking at working with the primary care physician, working with the discharge um, and also working with other entities that might be able to help, such as uh, American Cancer Society or the Diabetic Association, and seeing if that patient would be able to have someone to call in and check in on them, uh, you know, frequently, especially if they're newly diagnosed. Um, sometimes housing, employment also impact, which are disparities, you know, psychosocial. Uh, uh, psychosocial uh, concerns, you know, they might have kids they need to take care of. Um, socioeconomic impacts that as well too. Next slide. So if we put it in a, a, a complex or uh, a more of a, a, trans, a transversal um, component of taking care of our patients, what does the implication of having an intervention will look like? That's something we have to consider. Um, so we all know that social determinants also impacts the education of a, a, a person. So if a person doesn't have the knowledge they need to be able to succeed in taking care of them, how do we reach that? Uh, we talked a little bit about gender, you know, uh, ethnicity and their status uh, in regards to being able to have insurance or not have insurance and how do we get those resources for the patient uh, and minimize those disparities so that they'll be able to take care of themselves. That is the community impact that we look at and that we look for. Next slide. So an example of an intervention will look like, a, you know, being able to work with numerous organizations, such as the national prevention organizations, um, health promotion organizations, having an impact with being able to fund or have grants uh, in a community setting that would be able to, for example, have a church uh, do uh, an education on diabetes. Um, a lot of NIH grants do that, and as, a, as we look at population health, as nurses, as physicians, as healthcare workers, we, we need to broaden our um, resources to those things and impact in uh, patient perspective. Sometimes the organizations we work with might not have the resources, and we maybe can utilize other resources such as grants, scholarships, um, to be able to impact uh, the community that we're looking at. Now, nonprofit organizations that, and also improving the health of the population will also look like, is it regional? Is it state? Um, is it the community we're looking at and what kind of resources they have? And uh, population health takes a diverse look at that. Um, it doesn't just look at the individual, but looks at where the individual resides and all the things that impacts them. Next slide. In order to be able to do this, uh, a collaborative impact will also look at the healthcare providers and what we do, whether it's inpatient or outpatient, whether it's in the community. Um, sometimes when, as healthcare workers, we're making decisions, we tend to forget about the community organizations, such as the schools, the businesses, you know, the what is available in that community and how we can use it to impact the patient care. Um, 
we tend to be very silo when we're working with patients or populations in regards to here is what we have to do inpatient. And when the patient is discharged, the outpatient setting can take care of it. Uh, we should look at it as a con continuation of care um, to make the patient better. So having systems in place such as social workers, uh, navigators, uh, discharge planners, um, collaborating with visiting nurses, collaborating with the Boys and Girls Club, the churches, um, might have more of a collaborative impact than caring for um, our patient in a siloed uh, my manner. Next slide, please. So partnership uh, is what basically we, when we describe collaborative impact we're discussing. So the care delivery models that we have right now doesn't reside in just hospitals anymore. And we've talked about um, inpatient, outpatient, and um, nursing homes. There is very diverse settings that uh, our patients are discharged to or receive care at. And those models need to be taken care, uh, taken into consideration when we're planning um, care for patients. Next slide. So what does that imply? As we know, there are disparities and there are certain um, Populations that are more affected by certain conditions and social determinants play part in it. However, if, um, as I described, you have someone who lives in a neighborhood where they don't have those resources and we as healthcare workers do not consider that discharge the patient, the likelihood of them showing up in the ED is greater. And what kind of, what is their vulnerability? Such as, you know, what disadvantages do they have? Do they have insurance? Do they not have insurance? Do they know how to, do they understand us? Do we think a, a diabetic patient who is inpatient for two days or three days discharge is able to take care of themselves with one day of teaching? Do we think they would need more teaching? And if, what does that look like? Um, how are we collaborating with the physician in the primary setting, the outpatient setting, to be able to make sure that patient continuation of care is ongoing? Who is monitoring that patient to see if they are really, you know, um, have checking their blood, blood glucose levels um, and also knowing when to do it? The critical times of patient's care, especially in new diagnosis, is usually in the first six months. Um, and when we discharge patients in from out, inpatient to outpatient, we're looking at days. Um, so that also needs to be considered. Uh, you know, examples of preconditions that we have to keep in mind is patients who come in with asthma, obesity, diabetes, cancer, and the list can go on and on. Um, however, our clinical picture of that patient plays a huge part in how they progress uh, and how they do in their care. Next slide. So what can we do as healthcare workers? As we know, it's the patient outcomes that plays part, you know, policies and procedures plays part, and having that resource for, from the community plays part too. So being able to voice our opinions on legislations that come up as healthcare workers is very important. Um, whether it's local, whether it's state, uh, we have to pay attention to it and be able to voice our opinions on policies and procedures, not only in our institutions, uh, but in the state and also um, as a global population health as it comes up. Uh, prevention always is good. Um, having those prevention talks, the health promotion and education. And that's when the grants come in as nurses and as healthcare workers, um, no matter what field you're in, there's always something you can do to impact and, and teaching and knowing where to find those grants. Um, recently, we talked about grants and someone said, what is $200 going to do? And an example of that is we were able to educate a group of teenagers about HPV with $200. You just have um, a luncheon, invite them, invite that community, um, have they talk about it, listen to what they have to say, and answer their questions in a way that is very uh, educational to them. And, you know, not only took $200,
However, it went a, a, a whole lot of ways to be able to reach about 200 uh, teenagers in that perspective. So someone, it does not need to be a huge budget for us to make an impact. And that's what population is looking at, um, delivering in a very low cost uh, environment by making a huge impact. Um, that's what we have to keep in mind. So these are my references and we will open it up for questions. Thank you. Um, we have a, a presentation, Dr. Neal. Yes. Um, this is a presentation on population health. Hello, my name is Dr. Carol Jenkins Neal, college professor of nursing. My main concern with COVID-19 is population health and health disparities. Very important topic. Population health can take on several populations, the mental health community, the senior community, the vulnerable population. In Jacksonville, we have an area health zone one. I'm very concerned about health zone one. This is an area that is considered as a vulnerable community or population. The population, a lot of people don't think about the unborn children and babies that are born with COVID-19 and how that is impacting the family. With COVID-19, some of the things that are serious right now that we need to consider across the board, not just in Jacksonville, are those individuals with lack of access to care, lack of insurance, and lack of finances. Those three factors alone is major when it comes to COVID-19 or any other chronic condition. As healthcare professionals, we need to acknowledge that health disparities is here and we need to take a stand so that we can make an impact in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Now the floor is open for questions. As I asked before, please put your questions in the chat box. And as I'm looking in the chat box, there are no questions as of yet. So I would like to um, ask presenters to please talk a little bit more about rural communities in this COVID. Um, well, it's really in urban communities too, because we're all being isolated and the nursing professions are really um, involved in firsthand basis on um, COVID um, treatment. And how does this impact our uh, discussion on population health? Um, Dr. Carol Neal here. One thing I think is so important as nurses, as I said in the video, getting out, educating the community, um, reaching out to the different churches, because for some reason, when you reach the churches, the pastors have a way of, of talking to the congregation and, in the city of Jacksonville, um, First Coast Black Nurses, we are trying to pass masses out to um, different populations and low income populations to make sure that they are protected. So I think as nurses, we need to find a group um, and try to reach out and educate that particular population. This is Dr. Brian. Can you hear me, Dr. Goins? Yes. yes. Um, I would like to um, say that for the past two weeks, I've been doing sports physicals with high school and middle, um, middle school age children. And so I use that platform as an opportunity to talk to them about COVID-19. Um, some of the students were coming there with, all of them had their masks, but some of them were coming there with their masks below their nose and some on their chin and I would look at them and I would pull, I would just make the sign, pull your mask up. And so I, would, I educated them on the importance of making sure that they wore their mask and also that they 
protected themselves as well as the person around them because I tell them, I say COVID-19 is alive and well. And I say, it doesn't care who it takes out. I said, so don't think that you're immune to it. Make sure that you are protecting yourself and your family. So I just thought that it was important for me to use that time with those students to let them know that even though they might not have had someone in their family to um, have COVID or maybe they did know someone, but I just wanted them to know the realization and also to let them know that they needed to um, be mindful of wearing their mask and that they needed to protect themselves because I don't think that they were really um, aware. I think they were aware, but you know, sometimes adolescents think that they are um, invisible, nothing can happen to them. So we just have to be mindful and remind them of um, this, what, what is going on and that there is no end in sight so far. And um, this is Angela, um, living in New York and practicing in um, a state border of Jersey. Um, I have seen um, how COVID has impacted a population health. So New York ha has one of the strictest and um, well diverse population health management in my perspective of managing the COVID. However, looking at the broader perspective of uh, how it was, it impacts different ethnicity and um, you, know, you take a look at prevention and things like that, it's all about education and how that is rolled out. Um, so being mindful of the fact that when we're talking about whether it's disease prevention, disease uh, promotion or a health promotion or basically taking care of a community, we have to remember those regulations and legislations, whether it's a state-driven, a community-driven, or a global um, pandemic such as COVID. Um, you know, one thing I have noticed is that one state can do it very well. However, if another state is not doing that, there's travels, there is family visits and things like that. And that is what population health some looks like, look like. And, and you, we have to consider all those things. Um, and I'm hoping that, that this will be an example of how we can look at things in the future and put population health into perspective. Thank you. One of our questions um, is, as the number of minorities are infected with the virus and the lack of testing and delay in getting results, what additional actions can we take to empower our community to speak out? Hmm. Um, I'll take that. I think just because I have seen New Yorkers speak out and it's been very effective. One thing we can do is every single state, every single neighborhood has a representative. So don't be afraid to knock on their door, send them an email um, and, you know, be part of the, the, the talks in your communities. You know, there are areas like the YMCA's that hold sessions for communities to come talk about uh, the COVID and how it's impacting them. There, there's councils that talk about, sometimes we don't know about them and educating ourselves and resources as to how to find those things and using them to impact us. Um, it's, it's a good way to deal with, to, to go about it. Um, there's one thing that I noticed, um, and um, it, I think it's, it's that way, I'm in South Carolina, so I think it's that way across the nation, is that people aren't gathering, and everybody doesn't have um, computers and stuff, and especially um, with the school systems, they're fighting that also, like, are we going to let our kids come back to school? But, um, so... What do you think about in regards to those um, communities, the people that um, are isolated, um, are not able to get out to go to sessions, they aren't having sessions because the cleaning up after the sessions, the cleaning up before the sessions, the showing that people are wearing masks and are social distancing is an added burden um, on communities. So what are the other ways that you think that people can um, speak out?
Okay. Well, I'm thinking one of the population I'm thinking about um, with looking at the second question, um, I'm really thinking about making sure everyone is being safe. For an example, um, I like to go walk on the beach at early in the morning to see the sunrise. And um, it's amazing on the beach, everybody is practicing social distancing, which I think is um, very important. But I'm thinking about populations um, that no one is thinking about. For an example, the senior high rise centers, no one's really going to those areas. Um, having a mobile unit to go to those particular areas and test those individuals to make sure that they are safe, I think is so important. That is the best support possible because you are going in and testing them. And unfortunately, that's how we are losing a lot of our people in the seniors, um, the high rises are in the um, nursing homes communities because no one's testing them. And so I think as nurses, we need to um, be an advocate for the population that cannot speak for themselves, the homeless population, to make sure that they are being tested. Um, to point them into that direction when others aren't. Um, thank you. That goes to our next question. How can we enhance support for populations in nursing homes with regard to the impact of COVID-19? I'll just share that my mother was in a nursing facility at the beginning of the epidemic in March. And um, as an infection control nurse, uh, formerly infection control nurse, I just took her out. Because um, I, I, I just know in that closed community um, with um, not so adequate um, infection control practices on a regular basis that mm -hmm. she was going to be um, impacted. But do you have anything to say about that question in addition to what you've already said? Well, as I stated, um, it, we're dealing with a vulnerable population. I mean... I think that was very smart to take your mom out of that situation. But unfortunately, everybody doesn't have that capability. Exactly. Um, so yes, as nurses, I think we need to speak up. I can think of several nursing homes right now that would love if someone would just come and test them. The nursing director has, is actually, has actually called um, to see if someone would please come and just test them at two senior high rises I'm aware of. But unfortunately, as I think Dr. Um, Bryant said earlier, you need to get your um, legislators involved. You need to get the healthcare community involved. Somebody actually needs to care in order to make a difference because if, if we don't look what is going to happen. And in the state of Florida, as you all know, with COVID-19, our numbers are constantly rising. We would love to um, borrow the governor from New York, Angela, but um, unfortunately, <laughs> that's not the case. <laughs> oh, um, I, there's no other questions. I, I'll just talk about one other thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, more and more, um, they are doing outpatient surgery. I know um, a family member had an appendectomy, and that was an outpatient surgery. Um, another family member had a hysterectomy, and that was an outpatient surgery. Um, when I had uh, my uh, rotator cuff, that was an outpatient surgery. My meniscus torn, that was an outpatient surgery. So more and more, we're going to outpatient services. How does that impact um, population health when we're used to having and people have surgery, at least spend 24 hours observation before we send them back to the community from which they came and not knowing how, what kind of care they'll be able to get once they go back to their homes. I really believe a lot, we're going to have more people with at risk um, for complications and unfortunately, um, don't get the proper opportunity to heal fully. I really think that is what's going to happen. Um, 24 hours for a hysterectomy? Wow. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Captain in your town, Jacksonville. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> I don't know the name of the hospital. <laughs> yes, that's unbelievable. Um, yes, I'm really concerned with dialysis. Um, I found out lots of patients are canceling dialysis because yeah. of COVID-19. And that really concerns me as well. So I think we're going to have more complications and more people being admitted in the hospitals. I, I think that what we presented today has been about how population health impacts all of all the lives of the people and not just um, for the time that they're in the hospital. And I think that as healthcare professionals, we, um, we, are, we are being more and more aware of how the social determinants of health, how the environment, how where their self-care how it's all impacting um, people's ability to recover to heal um, and to prevent um, all kinds of complications yes all righty um that's um we're at 255 which is five more minutes does anyone else have any more questions I think we have one more in the chat box. Oh, I see that. For your, for their safety, it is better for them to return home ASAP with outpatient support. The media with the negative reports from the White House occupant is scaring people and preventing them from seeking care. That is so true. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Dr. Bryant, I, I agree with that statement. A lot of people are afraid to go and stay for a long period of time. So they're rather that they have it and come home immediately because um, before most, most procedures, I know they're doing COVID testing before a patient um, have a procedure. I mean, speaking to some of my um, colleagues that work, you know, um, in those outpatient areas. So I guess they are saying they take their, do their tests, it's negative. They want to keep it that way, make sure, you know, that they um, leave without having a positive test and go home. But again, as healthcare providers, we need to make sure that they have the resources at home and just make sure that they are not, we know that they're afraid, but we don't want them to go home without having support at home to help them to heal and to, um, you know, to get better as they um, recover from that procedure that they had done. Exactly, thank you. Any closing remarks real quick? All righty, I'm gonna remind everyone that registered that you will receive a follow-up email with an evaluation. Those of you that uh, want to have CEUs that have participated in this um, session today, uh, will receive, you will receive an email um, regarding that. And we thank you so much for being here with us. We need to always remember that um, healthcare occurs um, not just within the medical facility, but healthcare occurs throughout the entire environment. Remembering people's, not their physical ailment, but also their mental um, status and how does that impact them. And their health has a lot to do with people's work and um, we just wanted to share with you briefly um, some factors for um, population health and we hope that um, you have benefited from this and um, please come back for our next um, webinar which will be on kidney disease presented by the American Kidney Foundation. Thank you very much. And is that all my chairperson, Dr. Carol Neal? Yes, that is all. I would like to say thank you to each of the speakers. You did a phenomenal job. And we hope we get to see you guys back on August 25th for our next webinar on the fourth Tuesday of each month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.